Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Door to Door. It's Virginia Stanley here from the Library, 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 Library Love Fest team at HarperCollins. Joining me are my colleagues who can speak. What are your names? So I don't muddle them. Christopher Connolly here. Greetings, everyone. And Lena Mays. All right. And uh, well, we have a great show today. We are so excited to have authors Morgan Jerkins and Patrick Francis on with us to talk about their forthcoming books. Hello. Hello, Morgan. Hi, Patrick. Hi. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. We're so excited. Um, so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to, what we typically do is speak with one author first, put the other one in the virtual green room to have virtual M&Ms or virtual caviar. And then they'll come back and we can all talk a little bit longer about their books. But um, uh, Morgan, we're going we're gonna to put you into the virtual green room, but then you're going to come back and tell us mm -hmm. all about Call Baby, your debut fiction, which is so exciting. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, you're the author of uh, Wandering in Strange Lands, and this will be my undoing. And now this great, wonderful novel that um, we can't wait to dive in. We had you at the mm -hmm. panel at ALA, and so uh, that was really exciting. Mm -hmm. Lainey will talk more about that in a little bit. And Patrick Francis, we'll start with you with, with um, All the Children Are Home and also the author of uh, Orphans at Ray's Point and The Liar's Diary. Two really different, but not so different books in a strange way. I mean, uh, just uh, very strong and compelling characters and, and page turners, boy, you can't, uh, you can't stop. So uh, I'll stop talking and we will get to it. Morgan, enjoy the caviar. <laughs> or the M&Ms. Those are the only two options. But... <laughs> and what a combo. And then enjoy the Pepto-Bismol. <laughs> All right. See you soon, Morgan. Bye. Hi, Patry. How are you? Oh, I'm doing great. It's so happy to be here with you all. Well, we're so happy to have you. Thank you so much for taking time to talk to us about your new book. So where are you, Patrick, right now? I am on Cape Cod. Mm -hmm. How's the weather? Did you get yeah. on um, We had a total washout with the storm. We're expecting six inches of snow, but actually all the little bit of snow that we had was washed away. So, huh? you know, That's... I'm kind of sad about that. Yeah. Because I can't complain because I don't shovel it. <laughs> <laughs> There is something very exciting about snow coming, whether you- Yes, and we don't get a lot anymore, so. Yeah. Well, one other thing that's exciting is your new book, All the Children Are Home. Lainey, jacket. I'm sorry, I'm babbling about the, the snow, but it is on my mind. I love this jacket. Do you love it? I do love it. I do love it. God. Um, this book is so, is so moving and has, it's, it's such a wonderful um, coming of age, but also just a, an examination of um, the foster care system and families that foster care families that get it right. I love that you're shining the light on foster care families that get it right. Um, and so um, much to talk about, but not, I don't want to, um, spoil it for the readers. So I'm going to turn it over to you and ask you to talk about the book. What do you want readers, librarians, to know about this book? Uh, well, this book, um, of everything I've written, um, it's this one is particularly meaningful for me because I've really never written anything before that had um, um, any connection with my own life. And um, though this one is totally fiction, it does have a connection for me. And um, I did want to also shine that light on, on foster families that are, are not perfect as no families are. This is kind of a, a messed up family in a lot of ways. These two parents have been through a lot. They have their own issues. And yet um, what they do is um, they pay attention. You know, I was saying to a, I was saying to a friend that um, Dahlia, the foster mother, um, very much has her own issues, which are a major part of the story. And she's agoraphobic. She sits in the house with her jigsaw puzzles and a stack of books and the TV set in front of her. And, and she does what parents do, which is in the midst of your own muck and imperfection, 
ponder with every piece of the puzzle she puts in her jigsaw, what makes my child, what can I do to make my child thrive? And you know, the, above all else, that's what a child needs. Somebody um, who's paying enough attention to do that for them. And you know, these children are all, you know, come into the home, Agnes comes into the home. I mean, that that's the um, inciting event that this indigenous child comes into the home who's been so horribly neglected. And um, no one has ever, she's been diagnosed a dwarf. Nobody's ever paid enough attention to see that she actually has failure to thrive. They say she's slow, she can't, she doesn't speak properly, all, all these things. And, um, you know, the mother reluctantly, she's already raising three children as her own and she doesn't want another one. And she doesn't um, want to raise a, a, a mixed race child in her neighborhood. She's, she, she's very reluctant, but see, she sees this child. It's about being seen and um, which is what we all absolutely need. So it's about that and it's about, um, you know, about um, how you make a family and what it means to be a family. And even when it doesn't turn out perfectly, it's such a worthy endeavor to do it, you know. And, and, and in the process of this, I just heard about some amazing, amazing foster parents who, um, who, who took in, you know, one mother, she had raised 19 children and it was during the AIDS epidemic. And um, they were, you know, when um, babies were being born with AIDS, they weren't certain how it was contracted and people were really reluctant to take them in. And when no one else would take this baby home, a baby home from the hospital, they called this mother who had already raised 19 children. And she said, I'll be right over and, and gave this child who had a short life, but she gave her as much happiness as she could and, and care and love. and. You know, we don't, these are really the great heroes of our society. I mean, that, and you never hear about them. Yeah. Yeah. I was reading um, your, um, that story of that woman, Margaret, who had taken in that baby and she was pretty done. And um, <clears throat> I can imagine that you would get a lot of uh, um, you know, the research that you done, that you, that you did for this book could be sort of, um, you know, a beautiful story like that woman who just could not let that baby, you know, go unloved. And, and I'm sure that there were stories that were not so great. Um, and you, I think, do this really wonderful job of painting that picture. Yes, within, within this family of the, that, um, that they don't want a girl you know something is going on with this mother. The only reason she has a girl already is because she, because she came with her, her brother. They were sort of a pair. Um, can you talk about those, uh, the kids a little bit? I, 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 I love their personalities and how they are with each other um, and how they are with Agnes, who she's sort of the Margaret of the, well, the mother is sort of Margaret and that she takes her in and I love Agnes. We talked about this yesterday. I just think she's just a wonderful, beautiful soul. And as you say, hasn't really been paid attention to. And she thrives with that love and that cacophony of this house with these kids and all this stuff going on. And even the father, who's kind of a grump, but but is he? You know, can you right. want to talk about those characters a little bit? Um, yes, I love all those kids. I really do. It would be yeah. almost, you know, hard for me to choose a favorite. <laughs> um, Zadie um, and John are siblings. Their father had abandoned the family. Um, and a year, and the, the mother is trying to rebuild her life. She's diagnosed with cancer and she dies. And because um, they have no one else in the family to take them, they end up being orphans. And they have this legacy of um, losing their mother especially Zadie, um, John is a baby. So, and, and she has, and she's sort of been caring for John. So she's hyper responsible. And that's why she sort of insists when they, um, Dahlia doesn't want any girls, um, I, we stay together. And uh, she's, um, she wants to become a writer as the story goes along. And she's very, she's, she, 
she becomes sort of, um, she does the same thing with Agnes that she did, tried to do with her brother um, to be sort of a, a maternal figure in a way. Mm. And um, Agnes has also lost a sister, an older sister. She was separated from her older sister. So she naturally attaches herself to Zadie. And then we have Jimmy, who's the first child who was taken into the family and um, the parents just adore him. He's their everything. He's the child of two alcoholics. And as he's growing up, he has to look at, see in the paper his father's name for petty crimes, which is also his name and be taunted by friends about it. And um, he carries that legacy, uh, but he's a very protective and loyal over older brother. He's the first one who ever tells Agnes that he loves her because the parents are afraid to do that because they don't want her, they, they're not sure how committed they are to her. And, um, but he's the first one and he really unleashes something in her and their bond then becomes incredible. Uh, that after Agnes hears that, uh, is, is told she, she's loved for the first time, she goes out and starts saying it to everybody on the street, <laughs> which <laughs> leads to all kinds of things. <laughs> and, and that's just who she is. She has that in herself to be that way. Right, right. Including right. the uh, the old crabby lady across the The old crabby lady next door, who she kind of changes her life because yeah. you need to hear that, right? You know? So... Well, to, exactly to your point. I mean, that's that's kind of the key that needed to be turned for poor Agnes. And then for this woman who's lived her whole life and doesn't have a whole lot, go, you know, showing for it. And then here comes this little kid. Right. And it's, it's Agnes is really sort of magical in a way because she's very endearing. And as much as, you know, the parents are sort of like, you know, don't get too close, you know, don't get don't get too attached. It You can't not. Right. She has the strength in herself, even before in the chapter where you see her when she's in the abusive home and she's in oh. an attic and um, she has this something within herself, she calls it the river, you know, that yeah. the, the, even when everything else abandoned me, the river um, was never did and it said everything will be all right and I always believed it. And I think that certain people, certain have a great gift that just that great gift, you know? And um, as I said yesterday, um, I was partly inspired by the story from my former husband who um, lived a lot of Agnes's story. And, um, and, and he had this incredible resilience to get through this and turn out to be a decent person to get through this and live the first six years of his life um, in, in the most egregious neglect and abuse you could imagine. But um, somehow, he had something within himself. So that was another thing I really wanted to celebrate what these kids have, what the foster parents do and have, but also what the kids have, you know, that, um, and I, I just, you know, as writing it, or when I first read my husband's files and I pictured my own children, not even the abuse and neglect, but just going from door to door, from these house, house to house with no one to advocate for them. You know, as I said, no one paying attention, no, no one, um, you know, uh, one of the stories, which um, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't tell this in case I read a sequel, but um, Agnes is separated from her sister as my ex-husband was separated from his brother. And he had been told that his brother was mentally handicapped and in an institution and, and told that in the most stigmatizing language that people frequently used in the 50s, right? And um, it became just another another thing that's wrong with you to be ashamed of, right? And when he finally at age 50 got his records and we started, he sent them to me first and said, would you read these first and see if I can handle it? And after I did, I said, I really don't believe, there's something about this story. I don't believe that was true about your brother. So he went searching for him it wasn't as easy as it is now with the internet and everything, but he had a, uh, one of his brothers, foster brothers was a um, state police officer and um, he, they found him. And what happened was that he actually had had um, untreated ear infections and he was deaf and he was misdiagnosed and put in an institution. And, you know, his story also had a positive ending that someone who worked there observed was paying attention mm -hmm. and adopted him. 
Um, and, 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 you know, so it's just, um, it's once again, that issue of just the child going from house to house and you, you know, you do see your own children is, it's almost worse than the uh, abuse that for someone to be so unrecognized. To be invisible. To be invisible, invisible, and no one's paying attention. No one's going down to the school when your kid gets picked on. Nobody's noticing that um, maybe you're not a dwarf. Maybe there's something else going on or that you're actually very bright. Maybe you can't communicate for another reason, you know, so. Yeah. Um, so there's Agnes and she gets into this house and Jimmy says, if anybody hurts you, I have my baseball bat. That's right. That's my right. hero. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's really a powerful story. And of course, more to it, of course, with the mother and her backstory and why she is the way she is. And of course that, um, that sort of like layers of an onion gets peeled away bit by bit and you start to see what's going on there. Um, but, uh, paying attention, that's, um, uh, yeah, wait, that's, that says everything. Um, do you, I know you want to read a little bit from the book? Oh, yes. Yes. Now I'm going to read this. You have to see this was written long before the pandemic. So don't laugh at the first sentence, the first sentence of the book. This is from, uh, the prologue. It's Dahlia, the foster mother's perspective. I used to think that if I just stayed home, I would be safe. So when the chance come, I struck a deal with a boy so homely and tongue-tied, no one else would have him. I'd put some kind of supper on the table and sleep in his bed every night, and he'd bring me jigsaws and teetering stacks of books from the library and never asked me to leave the house again. Louis was just 19, and me, I was even younger, though I hadn't felt like a girl in a long time. Then one night I woke up to a particular kind of lonesome, one that couldn't be answered by him or the people who kept company with me on my TV or the ones that me moved between my books and my head and sometimes much deeper. It was the ache that wants a child and no matter how, how I tried to shoo it out, it wouldn't go. That's when I found out there is no safe place that even locked up in my six rooms, I never stopped traveling. And what's more, there was some kind of unseen direction to it all what it was and why, well, I wouldn't begin to understand that till the kids were practically grown. And most I don't expect to know in this lifetime. But once I got a glimpse, everyone looked different. Louis and the boy my loneliness drug to the door and all the rest that followed. It was like there was a radiance to them. I only wish I'd seen it sooner. I only wish everyone could see it. That's beautiful. Great setup too, you know, you really. There's a lot, it's like Dahlia's story is sort of hidden in there. And, um, you know, I, oh, one thing I love is how, you know, Dahlia reluctantly, she does so much for the, for the kids, you know, and she sort of saves their lives in a way. And, in, and then as the story evolves, the girls, the ones she didn't want, do the same for her. Mm and sort of uh, lead, lead her out of her own personal darkness. Or maybe all of them, you know, Jimmy as well, who's a big motivating factor for her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's just so crazy about him. But um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, uh, that's a good point. Um, let's see, it's 20 after. How are we doing on questions and comments here? So much love for this book and excitement. I do just want to take a moment to call out a huge fan of yours, Patrice. Uh, Diane Short LaRue says, The Orphans of Grace Point is one of my all-time favorite books, so I am so excited to read All the Children Are Home. Um, so that's fantastic to hear. Our friend Maureen Roberts asked, uh, in your research, how different was the foster program in the 50s and 60s than it is today? Um, well, one key difference was that um, custody wasn't removed from the parents, you know, at the way it is now, you know, that they pretty much retained custody, which meant that the foster parents, um, it was very insecure. They couldn't adopt these children, but they bonded with them as their own children, but they had to know that at any time they could be taken away. Um, so that, that was very, one very key difference. You know, I think a lot of the problems and the strengths remain. 
otherwise. Can I ask you a question? Why, um, why did you set it? You set it um, in the 50s, right? Was in the 50s? Yes. Why, why? Why did you choose the setting time and place that you did? Um, well, that was the story that I, I based on that was when it occurred. And um, that was just really fun for me to write about because um, a lot of it was from my own childhood. And so I'm writing a lot of, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> when I first connected with my editor, she said, oh, I love it. I know all these references. Some people might not know who Gina Lola Brigitter is, right? But I do. <laughs> and uh, so that was really fun for me. And it was natural. And I didn't have to, the research was in my own head. So I didn't have to do that. And I sort of said it in a neighborhood that was like the one where I grew up. So that was fun as well. Speaking of research and um, I know you, you talk about this with the social workers experiences because you know, sometimes she's not on time or she's as upset as the foster parents and she has to take or move people around. So I know it's a very complicated system. Did you do a lot of research about the, the foster child programs? Um, well, I most I spoke to a couple of people who, you know, one who worked um, for many years, the one the one who told me the story about Margaret um, and she had been a supervisor and she had she so she had a lot and another and another person who had also done it um, more recently. And then just from knowing from experience from knowing people who were in foster care so I did that. It, it's, you know, it's very interesting. And like I say, you, you, like you said, you hear the negative stories so often and they're horrifying, um, but there are so many amazing foster, you know, there are people who just do it for money and there are people who even for more nefarious purposes and and there are people like um, Dahlia and Louie that they want children and they're, they're, not in a, they're not in a position to adopt. Um, and this is a way to bring children in their life and treat them like their own children. And that's pretty amazing with all the risks that that entails, especially as I said in that time, they, were, they weren't free for adoption. And Patrick, so, you know, the book deals with, you know, generational trauma and addiction. And, and you talked about that, you know, this is kind of a big question, but, you know, with what can society do to kind of break these cycles that you're writing about in the book? Right, that's that's one thing, you know, that's sort of Dahlia's question. She sees, you know, in her, um, what can I do to make these children thrive? She sees they have these background and that a lot of this is um, as a genetic factor. And, and she sort of warns, particularly Jimmy, don't ever, don't ever drink, that's not for you. But, you know, that's sort of the just say no, you know, and, um, um, that was a question I, I want the book to pose, you know, it's a question I've had to deal with my own life. How, how do we deal with people who um, might have this genetic predisposition, you know, and why aren't doctors, you know, as part of, you know, they say you have, di you have diabetes in your family, you have this, you have that, um, you know, why isn't there more awareness of that? I, I don't really know the answer, but I'm part of, um, what novels do is ask questions and, and just raise them in people's heads like you like in yours right that I, I want that I want people to say how can we um how can we prevent this which is so sometimes so much of a vicious cycle right you know kids have uh learning disabilities or whatever and they don't feel good in their own skin and then they drink and then they make poor decisions and then they feel even worse about themselves and you know um I uh, did some volunteering in the um, local prison and almost everyone there, that's their story, right? Uh, how do we prevent that? So, you know, readers everywhere can figure that out. <laughs> well, I think the book poses a lot of great questions too, because it really does make you think and you uh, peeled back, uh, you know, you just kind of pull the covers back to reveal what you know, sadly, uh, we hear about on the news, um, and uh, but but this is a real uh, personal look into into this family. And at the when we first started this conversation, I like that you quantified that it's not a family that's perfect. I mean, every no family is, and so um, 
but they do their best. Um, I, I kept making notes uh, because I, I found the, the, the story beautiful, the writing beautiful. And um, without giving anything away, at one point, um, uh, they, they're looking for Agnes. She's, they can't find her. And, and now she's just wrapped herself around their hearts. And um, Dahlia calls the police station, the mother, Dahlia, calls the police station looking for Agnes. And Chief Wood answers the phone. And you know immediately something's up there. There's something, right? And I just want to read this, this line because the, he says to her, you have one hell of a nerve calling this number, brazen as ever I see. And she says, well, you would have thought I'd die. After all, words like that spoken in the same tone had imprisoned me in my house for 20 years. Mm. Oh. <laughs> story, story within a story. Um, she's amazing. And that's the beginning of how her children um, help her to her own freedom. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we could go on forever, but we, we, but we just a few seconds left here, but I do love the imagery of the river when they go to the beach. Um, the the father, the foster father's mother, this funny Italian lady with this you know broken English who is just I love her. I, they're just all wonderful. They're wonderful characters. So thank you for all of them. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, can you say that again? The greatest gift an author can have when someone connects with their characters, you know? Well, I hope everybody connects. Uh, it, it's a gift. So as was Orphans at Race Point, um, this book will is also, a, there are so many quotes here. Can I, all the children are home. Uh, Patry Francis, it is um, on sale in April. Uh, what else can I tell you? Library Reads votes are due. March 1st, I want to read this one quote. There are many, um, but there's one from Carolyn Levitt, author of a New York Times bestselling author of uh, Pictures of You, With or Without You. She's, she's wonderful. And she calls this a shattering story of how the human spirit can surmount any odds, gorgeously written, profound, and so inspiring. It could be a roadmap of how to live. Mm. I don't know how, what Talia would say. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. A wonderful quote. She's so great. She yeah, beautiful. Um, okay, well, okay. you guys, do we have uh, more questions and comments, or should we move? Should we ask Patry to have virtual caviar? I, I think we got to the questions again. Just so much excitement and love for this book. Vicky Nesting can't, can't wait to read it. Mm. Um, but yeah, just I, I think this is one that people will not soon forget. So. For those of you watching, we are sharing the link to the eGalley on both Edelweiss and NetGalley, so you can download and read haste, but do savor it. Um, yeah, I, I, I think we covered it, so. Good luck going to bed, because <laughs> you won't. <laughs> all right, Patrick, we'll bring you back um, in a little bit, and then um, we'll all just talk, talk some more and say goodbye and say whatever we want to say. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, see you in a bit. Oh, boom. Juggernaut <laughs> authors with us today. How lucky are we? Yeah, that book is going to be great for book clubs. <clears throat> Lots to discuss. Mm. Oh, God, yeah. It's crazy great. Crazy great as is called, baby. Um, yes. Where's Morgan? Wouldn't it be funny if she was like eating caviar? and. and <laughs> <laughs> Uh, hi Morgan. See. Hi. Are you able to watch? Yes. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. Love it. It works. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, well, that was a, a wonderful conversation, and now we are so excited to talk to you about your debut fiction, Call Baby. Uh, right. And I, uh, I want to turn this over to Lainey because I want Lainey to do the honors of introducing you, and then also talk about. The program that uh, the two of you had worked on together for the American Library Association's recently held midwinter conference. So, mm -hmm. thank yeah. You. So, Morgan Jerkins, thank you so much for coming to speak with us. And we did that great 
AOA panel, which I'll talk about in just a second, but to give you a little intro that, well, a little, that's uh, small words because you have a big bio, so, but I'm going to say it in a few sentences. So okay. Morgan is the New York Times bestselling author of This Will Be Mine Doing and Wandering in Strange Lands, um, senior editor at Medium Zora Magazine. And your work's been featured in so many outlets, um, including New York, The New Yorker, Vogue, uh, Rolling Stone, BuzzFeed, I could go on. Book Riot has called you one of the smartest young writers of her generation. And um, this is your fiction debut, mm -hmm. which is so exciting. Mm -hmm. And we hope to hear more about that in a second. But mm -hmm. just quickly, before you tell us about the book, um, we have the link for our ALA panel that mm -hmm. you participated in. We had three authors, including you, and we it was all about different diverse characters so not you know just the books you open it up and you read about a character that maybe represents a lot of different people that is, are surrounding you or that or you yourself and you get to see them in that and it was so wonderful and I you know we had such fun talking about the book so that is up on Facebook and I don't know if we're sharing it now but that's on Facebook you can go watch it and what a wonderful conversation but um we'll let them go see that later. So do you want to tell us a little bit about Call Baby? Yes, I would love to. So I guess I'll start by just explaining what a call is. A call is when uh, the baby is born inside of the amniotic sac. In my family, we've called it um, a person that is born with a veil. So call baby, you know, in African American folklore, it's said that when you have a call, you have a specific gift. So I basically expounded upon it in my novel. Call family, excuse me, call baby is about a family of black women who have this special layer of skin and it's said to have a healing and restorative power. And they sell it as a tradition and to, and to retain their foothold in a gentrifying neighborhood, which is Harlem. Now this gets tricky because many of their consumers are white patrons and this puts them at odds with their community, especially when a woman named Layla, um, who's had many different miscarriages, she requests the call to protect her unborn but is denied. Um, her child ends up becoming stillborn and Layla's niece, Amara, vows to go after this call bearing family. Um, she's an aspiring lawyer and she wants to become district attorney. The, the catch is, is that when she was younger, um, she hit a pregnancy and she had a child that possessed this call, gave this child up, and that child got wrapped up with this family that turned their bodies into this enterprise. And so the book shows how these two families are connected and how they deal with motherhood, familial obligation, and of course, capitalism in the midst of a metropolis. Oh, that was wonderful. I, that was wonderful. Um, and Booklist, you just got a starred review coming up. And so yes. it says, multi-layered reflection of contemporary dilemmas with a touch of magical realism. On the heels of her excellent memoir, um, Jerkin solidifies herself as one of our guiding literary lights, which, what a quote. I know. Um, so memoir, I mean, uh, magical realism is very different than memoir. Yeah. So what was it like moving from nonfiction to fiction? Um, well, I'll be honest, fiction was my first love. So, and this will be my doing, I wrote about how I used writing as an outlet, um, like a therapeutic vent, and that writing was fiction. Uh, when I did my MFA at Bennington, I also studied fiction there. Um, I gained my voice and my prominence, I guess you would say, from writing nonfiction online, um, but that's what I studied. And so it was, ac I was actually in a, uh, one, my second to last ter term at Bennington and I call baby was initially a short story and my advisor was Alex Chi and he was the one who told me this needs to be a novel and he gave me books like all at Hagar's children um, by uh, Edward P. Jones and Tin Drum for example to read for inspiration and honestly it wasn't that hard in terms of magic rules I shouldn't say it like that but I think of this as a magical realist book, but it also feels very real to me. And that I have an aunt that was born with the call. And even though she's not selling pieces of it as a, as a business, she's very perceptive 
in a way that transcends what I can be able to explain. So I know black women like that, that can read people very well. And what I did was I hyperbolized it and just bent the rules a bit according to this world that I'm making. But the certain topics that I explored, namely gentrification, for example, um, and you know the precarity of black motherhood, all of that is prescient. And that was all because of things that I was going through at the time that I was writing it. Yeah. And we spoke a little bit at that panel about, you know, how Harlem is such a character and it felt mm -hmm. it's a great sense of place and mm -hmm. um, you do that so well. But there's also a lot of mixture of Southern culture as well because mm -hmm. they, have my, you know, migrated and mm -hmm. I guess that pulls in some of your past work mm -hmm. as well. But why mm -hmm. these two cultures? Well, I will say this. I mean, I've been living in Harlem for almost six years. It'll be six years this July, and it has influenced me a lot. It also influenced me because I remember when I first moved here, I want questioned if I was a gentrifier, if I was impinging upon someone's space, and I even wrote something in The Guardian about it. And so I knew that I always wanted Harlem to be a character. It was a character for Zora Neale Hurston. It was a character for so many other Black luminaries who came here to... Uh, to create and to create community. And that's why I wanted to incorporate it. With regards to the Southern culture, I mean, that I think I was influenced by that because of Wandering in Strange Lands. And I was trying to show the connection um, from the North to the South and you know the cross pollination of traditions and customs and the things that get lost, right? Because if you read the book, you'll see that this is a family that's originally from Louisiana. And there were a lot of things they couldn't take with them sometimes even family members of their own. And so they're pretty desperate um, for better or for worse to maintain their stakeholds in this uh, this neighborhood. And they don't know how long that's gonna last. Can we talk about the Melancons a little bit more? Cause I can't stop thinking about this family of women. Um, and cause I think when I started this book I expected them to be more of a villain i don't I, I know that sounds no, no, not, naive, yeah. but like and, and there are there's horrible things that happen to for them to maintain where they are you know they're they're somewhat ostracized and are you know looked upon with suspicion by the right. other residents could you mm -hmm. talk about crafting or you know bringing to life this family and all the good and bad that's within yeah those you know and i i love that you say like i went in there expecting a villain and i didn't hate them as much as I thought because I I don't like I don't want to create people that are black and white especially black women I wanted these uh, women to be very messy and I think you know I try to write a story where people can look at these women and say these women have been given a gift um, but the gift came with great cost and they knew from tradition that if they didn't take matters into their own hands with their own autonomy, then someone's going to take advantage of them and I don't want to give it away but there had been moments in the book where outsiders are trying to take advantage of them. But the problem is, is, is that I know this sounds kind of grandiose and philosophical, it's like how much, you know, autonomy can you have over yourself as a black woman when you live in this particular kind of society where money rules everything. Um, and I think that's the hard part is like, the more they try to band together for the sake of their legacy, for the sake of their business, the more they drive each other apart. Um, and that's what I wanted to show was like, families don't always get along. There were many moments in the book where I was like, how would you feel if your mother disappointed you or you disappointed your mother and to try to resurrect those feelings and of course amplify them for the sake of a novel. Um, but I also wanted to show that these women are also very alone. And that's why I also wanted to make the brownstone a character too, and to show the toll of what they were doing to themselves and to the people that surrounded them because all they have in each other. So, you know, there might be some readers who be like, I still don't like them and that's fine. But I wanted to people to see just how truly alone these women are and the lengths they go to for preservation but then you have to ask yourself at the same time, does that preservation come with a cost? And it does. I find it really interesting that, um, that you were studying fiction, that that was your kind of your, um, your goal or that mm -hmm. was singing mm -hmm. to your heart. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned Edward P. Jones, who's mm -hmm. just amazing. Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering who else, um, I love that your that your professor encouraged you to take this story and mm -hmm. 
helped you more with it. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering who, what other authors influenced you in addition to Edward P. Jones? Oh, I mean, Angela Flournoy is the Turner House, the way yeah. she wrestles with hates and the history of homes. And that was very influential for me. Um, Beloved, of course. Sure. Again, thinking about Setha's character and, 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 the, and the lengths that a Black mother would do to mm. save her child. Um, and so that was another book that spoke to me. Um, I love A Baby of the Family. Um, I actually use a quote from that Tina McElroy Ames that she wrote oh, about the yeah. call um, and in a pre, in an um, earlier novel. And so I read a little bit from hmm. that in order to get inspiration because I was like, I don't know where has the call been explored? I mean, of course, Charles Dickens explored in David Copperfield and I include a quote from that, but I wanted to, you know, have others that are like close to my identity. Um, and man, I, I, I think besides that, I mean, poetry, Lucille Clifton, she can be often very esoteric, for example, or woo woo, depending on, you know, your <laughs> uh, affinities. Um, but, and also just, thinking about Harlem itself, when I was revising the book, it happened at the beginning of the George Floyd protest. And right when I, and before that happened, as you know, during the pandemic, um, there was no sound. There was nothing. I couldn't hear the black woman that lived across from me. I couldn't hear the black woman lived right next to me. Um, all I heard was sirens. And that did something to me because sound is everything especially for black life. And so when I got to the tail end of revising it and all of a sudden there was this explosion of sound um, for this man whose last word was calling out to his mother. I know. Right? It, it definitely uh, reignited a lot in me. And I wanted this book to not only pulsate um, with thinking about Harlem as this historical city, but just to pulsate with just the feeling of being a black mother, period. Mm -hmm. um, I was very affected by... Um, the reports that it came out, um, the New York Times created a, a made a report um, a couple years ago that said that, you know, about how black, the black maternal mortality rates are even worse than they were in slavery. Um, how, how many times over a black woman may die um, than a white woman. And I was affected by that because I want to be a mother someday. And while I was writing this book, I would sometimes go under the covers at night and I would just like look at black babies on Instagram and I would ask my friend like this is so creepy I'm looking at somebody's child and I was like why am I looking at somebody's child and she was like because you're happy that they're alive and when she said that that made all the difference I'm sorry I get a little emotional but no, like I, ma I made this book and I thought about when Toni Morrison said in an interview years ago and I showed it to my students like if I'm going to write set this character and I think about losing a child, I have to hold my child. Yeah. And so I was thinking about the women I knew who lost children, the women I knew who uh, risked their lives to have their children, including my mother. And I'm hoping that when readers pick up this book, which I hope all of you do, um, that they understand those, those strides. Nothing, nothing fiercer, really, you know, mm -hmm, when mm -hmm. you think about it. Mm -hmm. And yes, <clears throat> George Floyd call, calling out for his mother. I mean, his life was ending right mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And that's, that was like a primal scream. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Right. And, you know, I, that, that really, and Harlem woke up again. Everybody yeah. was out in the streets. The sound came back mm -hmm. and I wanted to be able to capture um, that rhythm, that vibrancy, and it came and, and, and just being able to realize that like, oh, people are still around, mm -hmm. you know, even in the midst of a pandemic, people are still fighting. And, and, and coincidentally, the George Floyd process also landed on my birthday. So there's a whole lot of chaos oh, happening, wow. um, a whole lot of chaos happening last June, but it was all, it all was helpful for me. It was, it was grueling necessary work mm. um, and I don't take it for granted. Mm. No, that's, that's terribly clear. Um, and also, oh, that's a lot. Yeah, yeah, it is. I had a deadline and I was like, I got to get this done. Um, and rather than work against the sound, work towards it. So that's what I did. My, my, I live near Central Park. I wrote in the mornings with facing 
the window to see the direction in which the protesters were coming. And when you read the book, I incorporate a, a bit of politics and protests in mm -hmm. there yep. with regards to black women being centered. And I didn't know, like I was worried because I was like, oh man, people are gonna be like, oh God, she's bringing in, you know, all these prescient things that happen now. But I was like, how could I not? They couldn't not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it would be, you know, that would be bending to somebody else and mm -hmm. you couldn't do that, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's very strange that that was all converging at the same time. Very strange, yeah. 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 <laughs> and, and But also sort of like ticking these, you know, punching these little, you know, notes inside of you, you know, mm -hmm. that these, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's really so powerful. And I have to say, I never thought about the sound and that's a really, really interesting thing that you're saying. Yeah. I mean, that's another thing I want people to pick up in the novel yeah. is not just the cadence of the women's words and the ways in which they're talking. It's often in dialect, but also just like, imagine you going into a bodega and hearing the chimes. Imagine you hearing people cursing each other out on the street. Um, imagine the smell of fried chicken wafting through the air during the summer uh, afternoons. That is Harlem. That's my Harlem. And I wanted to be able to give honor to that in the book, especially now when everything is closed. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> um, OK, Chris Laney, comments, quotes. Yeah. Uh, well, Morgan, I just I, I wanted to ask about justice and revenge because I think those are two, you know, big yeah. pushes in the book. And I mean, so yeah, I mean, they they push it along. But Amara, who gave her child to the Melon mm -hmm. and then she's growing up with this single, like singular focus on revenge, justice. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I I maybe maybe you could expand upon that. But like, what was it like writing that? How yeah. So she it? she didn't actually she didn't even know she was giving it to them. All right. So I don't want to oh, give a right. spoiler. Yeah. She didn't, yeah, she didn't yeah, even know. She didn't yeah. even know. So honestly, I actually, and this is I hope no one takes this out of context. So please listen to what I'm always gonna say. I actually was inspired to mold Amara's later years by the rise of Kamala Harris and the conversation surrounding that rise, because there were people were like, she is great for black women. And then there are people like, well, think about other black women that may have suffered because of the policies that she enacted in California. And I thought this, and I was like, okay, let me think about it with this character. She is so focused on this one family and what this family had done to her aunt that she is willing to let anybody else basically languish as long as she gets to that goal. And so again, like I've been inspired. I mean, I've been, I was watching also a lot of TV and sometimes the crime shows that I watch, like I wanna see the people that are, that are morally conflicted. And that's why I started the second um, part two with that anecdote to show how things come back around and she is suffering physically. She's carrying the weight of so much. Um, and yeah, so with justice and revenge, I'm sorry. I mean, this is gonna sound really, really wrong, but it's like when you have someone that has that much power as the assistant DA and they have a vendetta and they have the police at their disposal, they're most likely gonna do some unethical things. Um, when you have that much power and you've been stewing um, this sort of spite for someone for so long, it's going to make you, for lack of a better phrase, wild out a bit. And that's where, you know, that's where I think the complexity with Amara comes in. It's like she knows she wants to give honor to her family. But what about the other families that have suffered because of her tenure? Yeah. And so both families are, are very different. They're both living in the same area, but one mm -hmm. is kind of holding on to this past and trying mm -hmm. to make sure their stature is solidified. And then the other one is kind of focused on the future in mm -hmm. ways, in some mm -hmm. ways not, but um, why two very different families having different experiences at this time and not just maybe one? Why'd you pick both of them? I think it's because of a lot of interracial conversations I've had where it's like, you have the melon melon cons or the melon songs. That's how uh, people, um, Cajun country, pronounce it. Um, but um, she, the the melon songs, they believe in we have to stick together for us. Nobody's gonna look out for us. 
we have to sit together as a unit. But then you have Amara's family where it's just like, no, you need to be thinking about the community, everybody for the community, not the people from the outside, even if those people help take care of you. So there's always this push and pull for like independence or collectivity. And and, that, and maybe that's not even just interracial conversation. That's also just in general, should I look out for my own or should I look out for everyone else? And can you have a bit of both? And that's what I wanted to basically show with these particular black women who are double minorities um, trying to deal with like, what can I have for me if I always have to think for someone else or what if I do this for everyone else and then what happens to myself? So everybody, yeah. you should see these comments. This your yeah. enthusiasm is contagious. Really? Can't wait to read this book. Yay. Just so excited <laughs> about That's revitalizing really Harlem. Like wonderful comments. Thank yeah. you. We have a couple questions. Did we get to the was the Maureen Roberts question for? Did we read that one yet? We haven't. We haven't. Okay. Why did I think we did? I don't know because I think it was the other one. Maureen Roberts from Baltimore County. Mm -hmm. Um, library. I think magical realism must be one of the most challenging genres to get the right tone and not go too over the top. Did you know that you were going to incorporate elements of magical realism uh, from the beginning? Um, and how challenging was it? Yeah, I knew. Um, I try to tell people Black life is fantastic. Um, and that's not to say that we're superhuman. I do not want to um, propagate that stereotype but there are some things that have happened in Harlem or just in my life where I'm like if I try to explain that to someone that's extremely rational they're gonna be like that did not happen or something and I knew that I wanted to incorporate the fantastic into this novel now was it hard yes because I'm still recreating and recreating a world and there are certain rules so when I got to the copy editing section of my book that the copy editor like, okay, no, you said this on page 15, but in 56, you're undermining. And I'm like, damn, like this one small detail. Like, so it, I think I knew I wanted to go in with magical realism and with the fantastic. Was it difficult? Yes, because when you start in the fantastic, even if there are many different elements of your story that is real, like the neighborhood or the name of this uh, chicken spot on the corner, you still have to be aware of the rules that you set. So if you were writing 80, 90,000 words, sometimes you forget some of those rules. And when you're stuck inside, you definitely forget those rules. So, so thank God for editors. Um, it, it was difficult. <laughs> oh. Friend Lillian Dabney says, Turner House is incredible. Toni Morrison's Paradise has Harlem as a main character as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm library librarian help and uh, wisdom uh, let's mm -hmm. see here we had another question here oh um now jennifer winberry asked what are you working on for your next project Ooh, if you're ready to talk about you it gonna no, be a no, 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 yeah we, we don't want to put you in a no, precarious no, situation no uh, no no it's i mean hey if my editors are watching and they know what to expect in a couple of months or so, maybe, I don't know. Um, I am working on historical fiction right now. I'm trying my hand at that. So now it's like taking into Water Exchange Lands and Call Baby and mixing together. But I will start by saying that um, there was a story that really, uh, that really affected me. It was about these uh, notorious slave traders um, their names were, I'm going to mess it up. It was like Isaac Armfield and some, Isaac Franklin and John Armfield. Um, and they were responsible for separating the most African-Americans in history. Um, the domestic slave trade, basically, um, where after it was illegal to import enslaved Black Africans, um, a lot of them were shipped down to the Deep South, Mississippi, New Orleans, and it was often seen as a fate worse than death. So basically, what I'm trying to write a story about now, knock on wood somewhere, um, I'm trying to write a love story of two enslaved uh, Black people who were separated at the brink of the Civil War and following their storylines across several generations leading into the present day when their descendants find each other again. Oh, we're ready. Sign us up. Yeah. <laughs> God. Um, um, can I just say this one? It's not a question. It's just Lillian Dabney, who mm -hmm. says, 
Black Life is Magical Realism. Think Coulson, Zora, Tony, Angela, August Wilson. There you go. Yeah, um, Lillian, you're cool. That's, I love that. I love that comment. Yeah. Beautiful. Uh, I was just going to say, I think you wanted to read a little bit before. Uh, oh, okay. Um, I, I was going to say, I could just keep to. talking. Um, I, either way. Yeah. So, I got hiccups. While I was, you know, in the green room, I had some sweet potatoes. You didn't know you had that back there. <laughs> okay. So, so I'm going to speak, I'm just going to read these two paragraphs about um, Namara's pregnancy. Um, so this comes up, you know, after her aunt Layla is denied the call and she gives birth to a stillborn child um, and she has a mental breakdown. And so I'm just reflecting on Amara's pregnancy all the while while this stuff is happening. She had not planned for it to happen. During the first few weeks of spring semester sophomore year, she found herself already behind in her reading for her law and ethics course. The only way to focus was to shut off her phone and check in with her accountability partner, Elijah. Elijah had an on and off again relationship with his high school sweetheart who anxiously awaited a proposal as soon as he graduated. He was someone with whom he, she'd struck a rapport during admitted students week and they worked alongside each other in her dorm. One night while studying, she kept her cell phone on silent and the alarm to remind her to take her birth control pill, which she'd been prescribed for acne, was neglected. As the night progressed, their concentration loosened and they started to crack jokes. Elijah pulled out two joints from his back pocket and asked if she would like a smoke. She agreed. Before dawn, they were naked beside each other in her soiled sheets. They never spoke of the night again. Amara never cried. When she first felt her stomach contort into knots in Butler Library, she thought it was in indigestion from another greasy quesadilla, but the pain persisted for a week. Her period hadn't arrived in months, but even with the pill, her cycle had always been erratic. Yet her sense of smell was so acute that the soap on someone's body could make her gag, and she blew her monthly allowance on food in a week and a half. She bought three pregnancy tests down in Kipps Bay, where no one would recognize her, and took each one in the AMC theater bathroom stall. All came out positive. A doctor at a Washington Heights birth clinic where she booked an appointment under a pseudonym confirmed the pregnancy at eight weeks exactly. This wasn't supposed to happen to her but she didn't want to get an abortion for who would go with her, a friend? And could that friend keep a secret for the rest of their lives? From the time of that doctor visit to days after Layla's arrival to her mother's home to take rest, Amara tried all kinds of abortifacent measures. She took a bath with boiling hot water and removed herself from the tub with nothing but peeled reddish skin to show for it. Not even three cups of St. John's Wart's tea did the trick. The consumption incapacitated her, leaving her dizzy and lightheaded and sensitive to any light. Then the flutters in her belly came, sometimes while she brushed her teeth, sometimes when she touched the side of her stomach, and most times when she lied down at night. Once the flutters came, she stopped trying. The movement in her belly meant that there was actually something there, and because she was mindful of a potential person growing inside her body, she didn't want to get an abortion. But there was no way that she could be a mother, especially not now. She knew how each of her family members would react. Layla would kill her. Her mother wouldn't speak to her. Her child was the cruelest of ironies. Amara wished that she could swap bodies with her aunt to give her what could have been a blessing in different circumstances. Oh. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. Congratulations on this, on this debut fiction. Thank you. Thank you. It's really. Cross. Yeah. Oh, come on. <laughs> so it's like very nerve wracking. Oh, uh, well, I can understand that, but there's a lot of fans and, um, you know, you've, uh, it's, it's exciting. It's really mm -hmm. exciting and powerful and informative and imaginative and, and um, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a wild story. And it's, it's just wonderful with so many people here. You can see the quotes yourselves in the comments. Just so much love here for you. So you. congratulations. Thank you. Thanks so much. And good for your Professor G. Yeah, Professor Chi, he's wonderful. Cool. Always Professor looking out. Chi. <laughs> Chi. Yeah, really, really wonderful. That's Thank great. Um, so do we have more questions or should we uh, bring Patrick back? 
we got to our questions. There's just so much love, and so the, they love the reading, but also very excited for this next book. Uh, oh my god, to have them ready to read. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's gonna be wild. Okay, so um, Morgan, thank you. Thank Tashi. you so much. Yeah. Um, Morgan, what was your what did you have back in the um, in the green room? What was it? Sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes. Patrick, did you get any sweet potatoes in the green? I room? did actually. I had vegan chili that had sweet potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> We're on the same page here. <laughs> And it was better than caviar. <laughs> oh, well, what is it? Yeah. <laughs> I had caviar once. Uh, um, so, so listen, thank you both so much for, for coming on and for sharing your stories and the backstory about your stories um, and for reading and just sharing these, these characters with us that uh, you, you, you won't forget them. You just won't. Uh, these are powerful stories that will touch your heart. Um, is there anything that um, Morgan or Patry or Chris or Lainey, anybody wants to say before we, we si- sign off? Uh, no, I just wanted to say thank you so much for inviting me to have this really warm conversation. I'm, I'm honored to be doing this alongside Patry. Just thanks. Yes, and I, I I feel the same way. It was it was great. It was really wonderful. It was so relaxed, and I um very um honored to be with Morgan. Oh, well, that's wonderful. And the librarians have such such um are such great fans of of both of your work, as you can see from the comments. If you haven't, you can look at them later. They're thrilled, as are we, to have both of you on today, and we congratulate you. Um, and both books are going on sale in April. Uh, Call Baby by uh, Morgan Jerkins and All the Children Are Home by Patrick Francis, both going on sale in April. And uh, we encourage you all to download the uh, eGalley and jump into these worlds and you won't wanna leave. And also do check out that uh, wonderful um, program that uh, Lainey uh, just Dove right in and and <clears throat> Lee, can you talk about it one more time this this American Library Association program that you sure. oversaw created. <laughs> so we were featured in the Diversity Pavilion. So you submit your program and you're accepted. And we wanted to talk about diversity in many different ways and show different experiences and and different books that show those experiences for characters. And so we had Morgan talk about Call Baby and we had Will Leach to talk about How Lucky, um, which is a physical disability. Um, and then we had Kat Sebastian um, for the queer principles of Kit Webb um, and that's a queer romance. And so it was just a really, really great half hour. We all sat there and um, each of you gave us a little, a little information about the book and then I asked you a question and we, um, it was really great and I think uh, I, I've, I've heard really good feedback about it and people ha- are luckily, ALA was gracious enough to say with courtesy, you can share the video. And so that's, uh, Chris shared the link. And so you can go and hear for yourselves. Um, it was really, really wonderful. And, and it was an honor speaking to both of you today too. It was, um, yes. And uh, just one more, just one more thing, which is not just one more thing, but it's a thing. And um, I think we should, mention this, speaking of the American Library Association, which as Lainey said, was so generous in allowing us to share that link to this diversity program, which is really, really stellar. Um, They uh, have also granted us, we will be posting this later today, uh, permission uh, with, uh, to to share the Cicely Tyson talk. Um, Ms. Tyson was one of the speakers at the American Library Association conference, promoting her book, Just As I Am, which just went on sale on Tuesday and then very sadly, her she passed away two days later on Thursday, last Thursday. So we were so shocked and saddened by this, but what a life she did have. And, um, and uh, it was an honor for us to, um, to bring her to the American Library Association and to have her speak there. Uh, she was interviewed by Donald Bogle, film historian. And so it's really wonderful. So uh, for anybody who wasn't able to get to the, um, 
American Library Association virtually. Uh, we will shortly have that up on Library Love Fest for you all to see, and it's really something special. So um, we salute Cicely Tyson and uh, honor her. And, and we honor both of you. Morgan, Patry, thank you again so much for today. And uh, you take good care, be well, and download and read, trust <laughs> us. <laughs> take good care all, all right. next Bye. time. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.